Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome back after lunch. Uh, thanks so much for staying with us. Good numbers. It's good to see, and there's loads of people after going to the other room as well. Isn't it nice to have someone else make lunch for you? It's the kind of thing that we've just lost in the last two years. Will we have another boring sandwich or tiny little burgers that have been made by somebody else? Uh, so it's, it's just nice to be back. So thanks to the CCD uh, for looking after us there over the last little while. We've got three great panels in this room, um, and we're going to be talking uh, about cybersecurity, and we're going to talk about zero trust, and we're going to talk about collective intelligence, uh, which I'd like to think we have in the room today, uh, but our panel is going to draw on that a little bit later. Uh, as you may very well know, there is a parallel uh, technical, AI technical discussion that's happening in Liffey too. So if you're into ML ops and automation, uh, if you're into security design in the cloud, uh, feature store operations that get visibility are lessons learned from applying AI to IT data, then you're in the wrong room. Uh, but if uh, you want to go and listen to that, that's in the room in Liffey too. But everyone else, uh, if you can, uh, take part in this conversation. So we're going to have a chat on stage, and then we're going to hopefully bring people in from the room. Now, the way it's going to work, uh, it's still uh, because of the cameras, not because of COVID. We have two microphones set up here. So if you have a question, I'm going to have to ask you to come to the microphone, or else shout really loudly at me. Uh, I, I will respond to both. Uh, but for the first panel discussion, will you please welcome to the stage for the great debate on cybersecurity. Uh, we've got Brian Johnson, the head of IT security for a university in the US. We have got uh, Donna Craven from the Irish Prison Service. Uh, welcome back, Laukik Suther from NCIS and Detective Chief Superintendent Pat Lorden from Angarda Shia Khanda, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Brian, we let you go down to the end there. Laukik, you can take the next one. Donna, you can take the next one and Pat, I always like to keep the guards close. I'm yeah. going to put you next to me there. Uh, Don, if we can move we you down, yes, oh, you if that's all right. Yeah, you definitely have the class. Now, it is lovely to see you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I, I'm going to begin down the end with you, Brian, if I can. Um, because uh, like we have an Irish conversation about what we, know, what we think we know and what we understand. But from your perspective, where are we at with cybersecurity globally right now amid everything that's going on? I think, uh, where are we at from a defensive standpoint or the threats? The threats to begin with. Well, the threats are definitely a challenge. And, and one of the areas that, that I, my background is uh, military intelligence with the Army, U.S. Army. And for me, um, looking at collateral damage is really important for me. Uh, because in my background, when you're planning an attack or you're, preparing to defend it against an attack, you have to go through sort of a bunch of planning factors. And collateral damage is a big one. And so where I, where I see uh, cybersecurity is, in cyber warfare, collateral damage is much different. So in a conventional fight, you're gonna be planning against targets, you're gonna be pl planning munition types, you're gonna be planning weapon systems. Um, and in con uh, cyber warfare, you're gonna be looking at you know, target ranges of networks, systems. You're gonna be looking at vulnerabilities, how many systems are affected by those vulnerabilities. You're gonna be talking about, uh, you know, what are the defensive capabilities or what are the controls in place at that organization that has the target system you're looking at. And all of those factors, we have a role, like everyone in this room is probably, there's a few exceptions, I think, but they're probably not in charge of conducting cyber attacks on nation states. Well, we'd like to think not. We like to We'd think, like to that, think that. that. I mean, some of them look a bit dodgy, but I, I don't I, think I, that dodgy. Uh, but we all have a role in how do we limit that collateral damage. Um, Lukic, if I can turn to you, um, when we think of cybersecurity, traditionally the, the, the CISOs in the room would have been focused on criminal activity, uh, people who are trying to effectively rob you, okay, which would be something that you'd, you'd bring the likes of Pat Lorden in or, or you guys for support in the States. How worried are we now more about nation state attacks uh, and the idea of guerrilla warfare being waged by uh, state actors as opposed to criminal actors? Yeah, very good uh, discussion point. Um, so when we talk about cyber warfare, there's, you know, you, traditionally you're supposed to know who hits you. You, in any type of attack, kinetic attack, you're going to have a bomb that comes from a plane that hits a area, and you know that plane is from X country, uh, or it's gonna be X militia or X grill. In cyber warfare, it's a little, you got a little bit of an anonymity. Now, when you're talking about guerrilla warfare and what you have to worry about is, you might have one person saying that it was me, but in reality it could be somebody else, or there's gonna be nobody saying anything at all. 
And that's where the fear comes in because if you don't have that uh, connection, then you don't know who to go to if it's an incident that they wanted to do to maximize because do you tell law enforcement or do you tell the counterintelligence expert, do you go to this area? And here's the information. No, you just have the remnants left. Um, so really talking about guerrilla warfare with multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, multiple areas of law, it gets very difficult to now engage with the nation they might have had the activity coming from there. Mm. I mean, it's, so, it, it's almost advantage bad guys, isn't it? That, that, that they have it set up in such a way that that fear factor, which we were talking about earlier, prevents reporting, prevents people from bringing in the official authorities who can start a proper investigation, or at least who can give you some level of support that might go above and beyond what you'd normally get off the shelf. That, that's right, especially if you have a DDoS. Uh, you're gonna get bots everywhere, and they're gonna come in from all locations. Uh, unless you take the bot down or identify who's controlling the bot, server client, then it gets a little, little bit harder. But you gotta have the companies really engaging with the law enforcement, with the government country, because if you don't, we don't have any of that information to go and follow up. Donna, we know that attacks are underreported. Okay, um, we had a big one last year that everybody was aware of, and it, it really it served purpose actually to heighten awareness about everybody about you know their own personal responsibilities. But for organisations, even within organisations, uh, it, there can be underreporting because people don't want to admit, "Whoops, I did that," and and that again gives an advantage to the individuals who are attacking. No, absolutely, and it is as you said, it's that fear factor, and. It's, you know, the cyberspace, there's this, there's this um, you know, the norms are cooperation and restraint, but it's the law of the jungle. And we need to, I think, increase the, the price of the bad behavior. Um, you know, this is, you know, cyber warfare. At what point um, do we determine that what has happened? I mean, arguably with the HSC, you could possibly say that that is warfare. There was civilians impacted mm. by that attack. Um, um, there's huge reputational damage. There's huge amount of money to be invested into um, upgrading systems now and making sure that the networks are hardened and that they're prepared and that we can see around the corner. But how can we see around the corner and how can we prepare? And I think organisations have to um, be transparent, report what's happening. That's the only way we're going to be able to learn and grow and develop and get ready to retaliate or defend ourselves, not retaliate, of course, but defend ourselves yeah. um, if and when there is an attack. Because there was a sense from people in other sectors uh, and other organizations when the HSE thing happened, there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, it could have happened to any of us. Uh, and you know, it, it, I'm presuming even in the prison service oh, where no. you normally lock people up for this kind of thing, <laughs> you, do, you double down on your security and you, you ran the rule over it. Well, this is it. And this is where you mentioned collateral damage. You know, we're a critical infrastructure for the state. Um, and um, public safety, and we're really good at physical infrastructure and keeping the bad guys in, but now we have to work on keeping bad guys out of our cyberspace. And it's the um, collateral damage of other networks being impacted, and we need to share this information. We need to come together and work strategically as partners together to understand how we may be impacted and what the long-term impact of this damage is to our systems. because we naturally had to respond as well. We do have a healthcare service within, you know, in, in the prisons, it's like a community behind walls. Mm. And we have, we nearly mirror a lot of the, the, the services that are out in your community. Yeah, Pat, uh, talk about warfare. The theory is it's a soldier fighting a soldier. Here, it is a soldier attacking a civilian. It's, it's trying to victimize an individual, a weak point in the link, isn't it? And it's about making people aware of that without scaring the living daylights out of them. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's trying to raise the awareness. And I suppose behind it all, the HSE attack has helped a lot of us in that regard, in that everybody from the youngest child to the oldest person amongst us has realized now that this is a serious threat because it's come to reality because you couldn't go and get your appointment, you couldn't go and get your operation done, and it was and still is affecting the HSE. So I think it's, it's been an important learning for a lot of entities. We have never had so many requests for webinars and talks, even in the virtual world. I think this week alone, I'm involved in three different events. This is the best one though, isn't it? Oh, this is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, well actually, no, yesterday's one. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday's one with the international 
uh, Police Women's Association in Dublin Castle was really interesting. I'm only joking. This is, <laughs> but I was uh, in the midst of a lot of police forces from around Europe, the U.S., Canada, and they're all in the same boat as we are. They're all looking at their cybersecurity capability, even within their own entities. So forget about investigating it. They have to look at what they're doing themselves. And our own IT, the same as Donna's, would have been looking at all of this over the last but again, cause, period of time. Because it was the health service that was attacked, and I know Absolutely. we focused on that. But it showed vulnerability. That showed, imagine if that had happened with Angara Siakana and the information, the sensitive information that's clearly stored by the guards. In the same yes, way that and it has happened in police forces. Yeah. Absolutely, and it's happened in US forces and different people over the years. And we can't... One thing that was put up this morning on the screen was, I know now they're gone. And I had personal experience of that about two years ago. A company lost one million euros. They were just about to lose another seven million euros in a business email compromise. And within two hours... I had a discussion with the CEO of the company and their head of IT. And I asked the question, are you sure now you've got rid of them? Are they gone? And the IT person, he's not here in the audience, I don't think, said, no, no, I'm 100% sure they're not there anymore. I'm not an expert on cyber, but I can sure as hell tell you that after one hour and a half or two hours, I don't know how sure he could be that they mm. were gone out of the system. Uh, I wouldn't have been that confident that they were. But I think looking at the underreporting, for example, I think the more reporting we have, the better. Uh, sometimes it'll be reliant on the, the private sector and the experts to deal with the problem. But at least by reporting to law enforcement, and we've heard it a few times this morning here, you'll help law enforcement understand it, but you'll also help maybe the next victim. Because if we've solved the problem, and we had an example of that about three years ago, where it was a very small attack on a company, and working with a few agencies, we were able to solve the problem. But four weeks later, there was a very serious attack on a bigger company, a much bigger company, but it was the same group and it was much easier to deal with. You, yeah, because you, you have... So you have a bit of knowledge. And, and I think the, the other element, I think, is we need to be ready for this because despite what's going on in Russia and Ukraine at the moment, uh, this can happen any day of the week, but it probably escalates it. Because when the war is going on, it was described this morning, the criminals that are not linked to Russia or Ukraine at all will also be looking at us to know how we weaknesses. Well, they'll take advantage. Absolutely. They'll take advantage while there's a heightened state of anxiety. Um, Brian, I, again, I don't know how much you pay attention, you, you actually paid to the HSE thing when it happened, but you know, we, we did subsequently find out it was a Conti attack. Uh, we know when they were hacked last week that there was a Russian involvement in it, so we got a lot more information. But there was a discussion at the time about whether they had actually meant to do what they did, uh, which was to shut down the entire HSE computer system. And that was disproportionate to whatever criminal activity they had wanted to pursue. The issue of proportionality is really, really important. And in cyber warfare, is it easier to do a lot of damage with a little activity? And is it easier to accidentally cause more damage than perhaps the actor may have intended? Absolutely. The short answer is absolutely. Um, the you know, proportionality is is another one of those planning factors for warfare. You know, con uh, conventional warfare, uh, typically, you know, your proportionality is the response you would give to an attack that took place against you. And with, with, you know, with conventional warfare, uh, I think, Lokik, you hit it uh, this morning a little bit. I think you talked about response and you were showing the missile and hitting the target and stuff. Um, but with, with cyber warfare, first of all, you know, I think it, with the attack on the HSE, if I remember correctly, they were in HSE systems for eight weeks prior to the attack happening. Yeah. Okay, so that, that wasn't obviously, that either wasn't known or it wasn't reported. Um, so with, with a proportional attack, you, you know, if you are hit, uh, or if, whether it's an accidental or an intentional one, to respond back is very difficult because you may not, one, know the pervasiveness of the attack. How many systems did it actually affect? How many hospitals actually went down? Or, you know, you may not know until six months after the fact that they were in your systems conducting the attack. Whether it's, you know, in this case, you know, for the HSC, ransomware, and it locked down the systems and, and they were completely inaccessible. But in a case where it's maybe a lesser form of warfare, it may not be noticeable right away. So a proportional response is almost... You know, it's it's very very difficult. It gets very complex very fast. Yeah, but ha you know, again, let's just break it down to black and white: good guys versus bad guys. How did the good guys respond proportionally to a disproportionate attack? 
um, it very, very cleverly. <laughs> but uh, it, it is very challenging um, knowing your target. No, like I talked about, you know, the collateral damage. You do before you conduct an attack. Um, you hope that all that reconnaissance has gone into it, right? And the care has gone into it. And I, I know we mentioned this morning. Someone mentioned about uh, the Russian attacks didn't hit anything that had Cyrillic language on the keyboard. Okay, so that's a very weird proportional response, right? Because that means I'm going to attack everyone else in the world. Um, but it, it is very difficult to get it right, um, and it takes a lot of skill. Um, where, where is with traditional cyber criminals, Laukic, if I could put it that way, the motivation is money. The motivation can often be money. There is a growing concern that the motivation should be fear that we can get you, we can shut you down, we can, we can disrupt you in ways that you haven't thought about yet. And that fear is, is a motivating factor because when we live in a world of social media where things are brought to our attention very, very quickly, when things go wrong, uh, if, if there's a nefarious state actor that attacks another state, the news gets out really quick, often quicker than anyone would possibly want it to, uh, hampering response. So is it propaganda? Is it fear? I mean, it's a, it's a very broad battlefield, if I could put it that way. It, it is. Um, when, when we, fear and, fe so I'll, I'll, I'll give an example of something that we all probably know about is you get scam calls. Oh, we I, get a lot I mean, of them. Uh, there's, they want to take your money from the I missed, taxes. I so, missed the African prince who offered to use give me millions. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I really saved really boring stuff about Irish revenue. Yeah, yeah there's a couple of princesses, princesses I saved uh, in the, uh, there but the that was not fear right that was using your emotion so it, it doesn't have to be necessarily fear it can be any emotion now fear is the greatest factor because what are they going to do to me to lock me out of my information are they going to change it so I don't know what happened and the other one is will they take it and you know and then the last one of course is melting down everything and making sure it's not usable and you're just going to have to start over from scratch. But it, it, the, the, these, these criminals will use that social media to let everybody know that this can happen and then when it happens, it might not be a big event, it might be a small event, it might, it might be a big event, you won't even know it, but it's a small event. Look at the countries that have been impacted um, in the past, you know, it's about Georgia, you, know, you talk about Estonia. Estonia did some great stuff there, but were those the precursors of what can happen in a larger location? Well, those small things that occurred in some of those countries have now been mirrored by guerrilla warfare or some, somebody else. Now the bigger countries are going the next step. And is that a fear factor? Will I die or will I lose information? Or will something go get exposed on the internet of me? Yeah. Right? That's, a, that's another fear factor. But is it fear of shaming, fear of money? Is it, maybe it's the opposite, maybe it's happiness. Maybe I was gonna do something, but I decided not to. Yeah, because, and, and there could be a financial impact as well. Mm -hmm. Donna, from, from the prison service's point of view, one of the most closely guarded things always in the prison service has been where prison officers live. Because the last thing you want is prison officers' addresses being posted online. It's, it's just, a, that would be the fear factor that would be there, and there's laws in place to prevent that from happening. But that's the kind of, that'd be, is that a motivating factor then to say, guys, we really need to up our game here, that the, the, the information that we have is not just about bad guys, it's about you and your colleagues, and the last thing we want to do is, is let somebody in by mistake. Is that a motivating factor to counter what Lokik is talking about? Uh, no, absolutely it is, and it's where, what, what I try to use to get the message across and you know, I think it's been reiterated by a number of the speakers today is that this isn't just a pure technology issue, the, the, the cyber security and the warfare and what will happen. This will impact people and so it's a policy issue and we need to get everybody to sit up and stand up and understand that we all have a role to play. The human factor is one of the biggest risks when it comes to potential breaches or, or somebody successfully infiltrating your, your systems. So we have a lot of information, a lot of personal information, a lot of sensitive information. We have information on um, historical pr um, people who are in our custody, current people in our custody, their families, their visitors. I mean, it's an inordinate amount of information and very sensitive information about, uh, you know, in, in terms of intelligence and 
the state of their health and everything. So we really need to think about this um, in a broader sense. And well, the, guy, the, the people, I was going to say, the guys who want to get in there, I'm presuming it is more guys than, than women, but the, the people who want to rob that information don't want to rob it to freak out your, your, uh, your staff. No. They just want to get money out of you guys or to disrupt the service, don't it's they? The, the information disrupt, is relevant. Oh, it's, the, 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 that information <coughs> is absolutely relevant. And what, I mean, the impact is uh, it would disrupt um, our service. It would destroy or impact the... Um, the assurance that the public have in us to maintain and ensure the integrity, the integrity and confidentiality of the information that we hold in our systems and the security and safeguards around those technical and organisational measures. So, uh, yeah, Pat, when we, we, we've done this conference a couple of times, uh, you and I, and Donna, you've been here as well. It's great to have our colleagues joining us from overseas. Uh, one of the things you always talk about is the need for interagency cooperation. And, you know, we, we have Interpol and, you know, we're involved in Europol and we've all these wonderful agencies that, that do kind of link up the whole time. But when it comes to this level of activity, you know, you're, 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 you kind of need NATO more than you need Interpol, if I could put it that way. How good uh, is the cooperation considering the scale of the challenge that's, that's potentially coming? Yeah, I think the cooperation has improved. I think probably will improve even further with what's gone on over the last number of weeks. But I, I think it's open to us and in Garda Shikana to talk to Interpol, Europol, but further afield in our colleagues in the US have been of great help to us over the years and in more, more recent past as well. Uh, for example, last week we were on a, a global um, crime forum with Interpol and one of my superintendents made a presentation to Asia in the afternoon and the next day he did a presentation to the US and that part of the world. And then the next day he did the European part of it. And basically what we were looking at was an organized crime gang that are operating in the cyber enabled crime world that Ronan would have mentioned this morning. You know, it's the phishing, the smishing, the business email compromise, romance fraud, investment fraud. And all of the money from that is being used then to fund other criminal activity, be it cyber warfare, be it human trafficking, be it drugs, uh, and one of my colleagues often use words, it's even paid to fund wars in other countries that wouldn't be as obvious as the one we're looking at at the moment. So there is great cooperation there. The, the problem we face sometimes is these networks that are coming at us from the fraud, they're coming from far away countries where we don't have the same impact on the ground with law enforcement. Yeah, but the, the other side of it that has, that's different and that's new is that where previously it might have been a briefcase full of dollars uh, or like, you know, it's, it's easy trace wired money. Yeah. You, you know, you guys have the ability to do that. With cryptocurrencies, uh, the conveniently created tool of the internet, these guys can make as much money as they want and you'll never find it. You'll never find it run through a bank. Well, and I know the Colonial Pipeline was covered this morning and the money was recovered by great work by the, the US authorities in that case. And there have been some success stories. And I think the, we've been looking at this for three or four months now, very detailed on the tools that are available to trace the money. And we've had quite a bit of success in tracing money into different wallets. The problem is when you get to that country, wherever it is, will you get the cooperation? So we've identified the country it's gone to. And actually we have the same problem with fiat currency if it goes to a country that's not willing to cooperate with yeah. you. So I wouldn't be terrified about cryptocurrency, but I think we need to learn a lot more about it, and it does need to be regulated a lot more. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, right, uh, let's throw it out to the floor if we can. If you have a question, uh, you might put up your hand um, or, or come to the microphone and I can, uh, you can shout at me and I shout at them is probably the best way to describe it. So has anyone got a question? Yes. Okay, so just to repeat for the purpose of the camera here, uh, cryptocurrency that's there, talk about lack of regulation. How should we fill those gaps, Pat? I might ask this, Loki, because you yeah. as well. How can we fill those gaps and, and where, is, where are the shortcomings right now? Yeah, so I would regularly attend FATF meetings in, in Paris. We're part of the FATF group. And for probably four or five years, up to two years ago when COVID hit us, the feeling around the table was that cryptocurrency was going to disappear into the ether and that it wasn't here to stay. But I think most countries around the table now have realized it's here to stay and we need to regulate it. We, know, we need to know who's purchasing it and who's selling it, the same as you would if you were purchasing a draft in the bank. And we don't have that regulation at the moment in most countries and most jurisdictions. It has been regulated quite well in Luxembourg, 
and I know uh, the head of the FIU there, they get regular suspicious transaction reports from the cryptocurrency exchanges that they're dealing with there. And that's public knowledge. So I think we need to, I, I never frighten people away from cryptocurrency. What I do say is make sure that you're buying it from a proper source, because we have a lot of people investing hundreds of thousands of euros every day in cryptocurrency, but they're not investing in it. They're buying it for the criminal who's going to steal it one hour later. Yeah. Uh, and that's happening quite a lot. But the regulation is going to be very difficult because it's going to be immersed in a lot of jurisdictions that are facilitating uh, the secrecy behind it. And I know we have some colleagues here from Switzerland, I suppose, so the Swiss banks have had the same issues, I suppose, over the years in regard to secrecy and compliance. And you saw there in the media recently, they've come more under the pressure there recently in relation to the way they're doing compliance. And that's not even in the cryptocurrency world. Yeah. Lots of challenges. It's not going to be an easy road, but I think it needs to be regulated by our central banks and our supervisory bodies. And then I think it'll be safer for all of us. Now, I'm presuming it's a very similar, big and all as the US is, you have the same problems as Pat here in Ireland, don't you? It's, it's, when we talk about regulation uh, or any place, how do you regulate something when it can be created out of thin air? If you really look at it, I can go tomorrow and create cryptocurrency if I knew how to do it. The ledgers themselves, depending on what type of cryptocurrency you have, you, you're going to have the, the widespread. You might, some of them are very public, some of them very private, some of them are more controlled, where it's a private ledger. <clears throat> but when it comes down to it, if I want to, tr to transfer large amounts of money from here to, say, Italy, currently it's very difficult. Now, if I use a currency with cryptocurrency, it's instantaneous, practically. Now, is it all criminals using it? No, not necessarily. People who want to make some money, I, I, I got that. But the way you can regulate it is going to involve multi-countries, multinationals. The jurisdiction is large, and you just need one to say, nah, I don't want to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's the good old-fashioned place you can hide where there's no extradition treaty, isn't it? It's, it's the same concept. Okay, thank you for that question. Have we another question from the floor? Um, uh, yes. Okay, so about knowing your customer uh, when it comes to crypto in particular, is it? Yeah, okay, so knowing your customer and how they use that. I mean, if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll come down the end to you if I can. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you work that one through, Brian? How do you explain it to your customer, whether they're doing the right thing and how you know that they're on board if you're dealing with customers and clients? Let me make sure I understand the question here. Uh, how do I explain it to my customers? Is that, is that yeah. No, sorry, no. do you want to go again? I probably K met a... KYC, I'd say. Yep. Know your customer when they're coming in. I can take it if you... Yeah, OK, Pat. Yeah. So KYC is a, an important part of the whole compliance with money laundering and terrorist financing legislation and obviously flows into nation state attacks and everything like that. So you're dead right. You have to know who's putting the money into your system. So there will have to be a system there that you know who's putting the money in. At the moment, if you go to Revolut or N52 or any of those, you have to produce your identification before they will accept and transfer your money. And you will have to have, I believe, the same in the cryptocurrency world. But that, once you have a few nations that don't impose that legislation, that will make a difficulty. And that's what you were just about to say, Brian, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, 100%. Uh, thank you. Sorry for making a mess of your question. Thank you very much for asking it. Uh, we'll take one more if we have it there from the floor. Anyone else? Just uh, Yeah, OK, sir. Okay, so in other words, it's offensive. Go on the offensive when you know who you're up against. And, and, and I suppose take the initiative. Ryan, you can definitely could take that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it, it is the, the two earlier things I talked about, collateral damage and then proportionality, um, they, they are kind of, they're easier to deal with. It, 
they're not easy. They're easier to deal with when you're talking about nation states who are, you know, have, uh, have oversight and they have, you know, regulation and they have, uh, you know, standards that they're adhering to. Um, offensive cyber in that scenario makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, it, it gets really complicated when, when you have non-state actors and uh, maybe state actors that uh, abide by a different set of rules. So, and I, I think in that, in, to answer the question, you're gonna have offensive cyber, that's not going away. But what we can do as a cyber, cybersecurity community is we have to shore up our gaps in our organization. You don't have to be a defense, you don't have to be a police force, um, but you have to you know, have a framework and, and apply that framework. You have to train your users. You have to, you know, the HSE attack was an email phishing attack. So you have to train your users on what to look out for. You know, uh, patch your systems, update your system, reduce your attack uh, uh, surface, and take on, uh, if you have a system that doesn't need to be publicly accessible, it's just for your employees, don't have it external to the internet. Close it down and, and, and just make sure you shore up your gaps so that you are not affected by the offensive cyber attacks. Mm. There's a wonderful phrase in radio that I've all, that's always stuck with me, and I, if something went wrong, um, the engineer would always explain that was an air gap. And I always wondered, what, what do you mean by the air gap? <laughs> there was a gap between the two cables, plugging it into the machine. You can't beat it, even when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, thank you very much for those questions. I have one final question for each of you before I let you go off the stage, and it's about how the next few months are going to go. Uh, how squeaky will our bums be if we're back at zero day con 23, God willing? Donna, I'll start with you. How worried are you about how the next few months are going to play out? Um, to be honest, I'm actually quite worried because I, I think, I mean, there's already a cyber war. There's already attacks. They're happening. I think based on the trajectory of what's happening now between Russia and the Ukraine, there, there's a um, there's a real risk that that's going to increase and possibly impact the Western world. So from a criminal justice sector point of view, or you know, in, in terms of government, critical infrastructure, the collateral damage being impacted, I think we have an awful lot of work to do and I think we need to um, start getting ready with our contingency plans, regardless of this anyways. We, we need to do that. Lager? Well, for me... Oh, I'll just say it, it's, it's job security, right? Uh, there's always going to be criminals that do anything, uh, uh, no matter what. But I've never known a year that's prior that has been any better than the one that you're currently in, meaning that I don't remember 2012 was worse than, say, 2013. No, 2013 was worse. 2014 was worse. It's, every year has gotten progressively worse. So in the next few months this year, it's going to be worse than 22. And 22 was pretty bad when I put it up there. Uh, I can only imagine what 24 and 23, 24 are going to be like if that's already bad. So, but we'll uh, deal with it. It, it. Job security. Yeah, still there. <laughs> like we're, wa we're watching fuel prices here. It's probably an indication of how, how it's going to go. Pat Lord, and same question. Yeah, I would agree with the two previous speakers. Um, I'm probably not afraid of it. I think Ireland Inc. is in a really good place. I think all of the people in the room here are doing the right thing. And I think that's very important. That we, we had a good dry run last year. Yeah, we had. <laughs> but I think if we have all the technology in place, and, you know, I was very taken, and I went out and spoke to him. Uh, he, I didn't buy a Swiss watch off him because they're quite expensive. <laughs> and he doesn't take cryptocurrency. But I, I think we need to work with our people. And he made it very clear, um, as did our, our speaker from London about the cancer research. You need to bring your people with you. There's no point in having all of the technology and not explaining how it's going to work. And I think if we work, and we're not good at this, we're very good at putting in the technology, we're very good at putting in the best experts in that area, but we need everybody else to play ball as well. And I think the other important point is, everybody in the room here should have their contact in their local law enforcement, whether it's to do with fraud, cyber-enabled crime, or pure cyber crime. And, and we have put a lot of resources into the Economic Crime Bureau over the last 12 months. We've almost doubled the number of people working on the cyber-enabled crime. And it's paying off. We're locking up a lot of these guys at the moment. Yep. And over the next six months, there'll be more. On the cybercrime... Let's keep them down in business, by the way. Don't yeah, yeah, we're going to fill keep, keep it up. Going that way. We, we will. <laughs> and then on the cybercrime side, more people are going in there in the next couple of weeks. And there will be hubs around the country as well that have been developed over the last two years. And they'll be getting better staff. So that'll make it easier for all of you around the country to link in with somebody 
from right. law enforcement. Right, and obviously you, you, you have your experience in the military. Uh, you're now working in education, which you might think is safe, but I know from speaking to people in education, it ain't safe at all, and that's the, one of the places they're going to target straight away. Uh, how do you feel the next few months are going to go? I think the, the likelihood of attacks permeating to you know, countries outside of Ukraine, very high, you know, very high. So what, the last thing I would like to say is just, you know, yes, yeah, so do all the, put the controls in place, make sure you have the right things in place to secure your systems, your users, your networks, but beyond that, assume breach, assume breach. Be prepared to respond to and recover from an attack. Okay, solid advice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have a huge round of applause for our panel? Brian Johnson from Liberty University, Lau Kik Suter from NCIS, Donna Craven from the Irish Prison Service, and Pat Lorden uh, from Angarda Shia Connor.